moving past just Googling it, harvesting and using OSINT. My name is Jessica Gallus Sands, and today's featured speaker is Micah Hoffman. If during the webcast you have any questions for Micah, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the webcast recording will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Micah. Thank you very much, Jessica. I appreciate it. And thank you all for attending. Thanks for spending your nights, days. I don't even know where you're coming in from, but uh, for the next hour or so, we're gonna have a lot of fun, I think. I find open source intelligence or OSINT as we call it to be just thrilling and, and really exciting. And what I'd like to do is just kind of walk you through some of the reasons why we, we don't always just use Google when we do open source intelligence. Uh, before that, I just wanted to preference some things. This should be interactive. If you have questions for me, toss them into the question and answer section, and I will get to them probably at the end of the session. So make sure you're very detailed in what you write in there. Um, if you're referring to a slide or technique that I'm using or, or a tool, uh, please go ahead and, and put those in there. And otherwise, uh, sit back, relax. And oh, um, I just have about like 10 slides, and then we're gonna do everything else live. So I kind of have to preface this. We're gonna go on the live internet and look at social media and some other things. I'm gonna do my best to make sure nothing disturbing or, or surprising uh, comes up on the screen. But if it does, please just let's all be adults about this and I will close my browser really, really quickly. Um, is, so uh, I am Micah Hoffman, as Jessica mentioned, and I remember a time when when the internet was young. Yes, when when the web pages were simple and where when we didn't even have these devices out there. When we used to dial up using a phone line that we would have to disconnect from our home phone and put into a modem, have to ask our mom and dad to if we can use that home phone to, to get on the internet, we'd log in, do whatever it is we needed to, to do, which usually wasn't that much, and then we log out and we were happy. But then years went by, and, and nowadays we have these, these mobile devices that are constantly streaming high definition uh, uh, content up to the internet all the time. They are pushing video and audio. They can receive down to the second type of updates for applications like email and other stuff. When we get maps now, we don't just get those old map quest things. Some of you probably remember these. The old map quests when you bring up the page and it would load like nine static tiles. And if you wanted to go one direction, you clicked on a button, you waited for nine more images to download, and then you could look at the map. Not anymore. We have things like this, like Google Maps, where you not only get the maps, but you get overlays with traffic. You have other things like coffee shops and ratings for those. All of these things are pushed down to our browsers all the time. And you know, the other thing, people are pushing more of their data up to the internet. You probably know these people, these people that when you go on vacation with those people, uh, they are taking pictures of everything and then they're, they're Instagramming it or they're using their other favorite social media site to check into places. And you're like, can't you just be in the moment? Can't you just enjoy the view here at wherever you are? And they're like, oh yeah. And they're scanning all the things and pushing it up to the web or they're taking pictures of their food and then they post that and then they take another bite, they take a bite of it and then they post that and each step through the meal is this endless stream of pictures and posting instead of dinner and conversation. The problem with this is that they don't just push pictures of their meal up, they might be tagging you in the pictures, they might be tagging the restaurant and these things, it can come back to haunt us later on. Some of the data that's pushed to the internet that we grab with open source intelligence, and we'll talk more about open source intelligence in just a second. Some of the information is not necessarily shared by you and me or shared um, because of anything that we did. It might be shared because of who we, what places we belong to. 
I'll bet many of you belong to churches, temples, mosques, boys and girls clubs, um, other community type of things like little league teams. And many of those have newsletters that are presented um, maybe monthly or weekly in some cases. And they don't email them out to y'all. No, that's so 1990s. They post them on their website. And just in case you missed last month's newsletter, guess what? They've got those and the month before and the year before and the year before. And many of these newsletters have extremely sensitive or private information in it. Information like pictures of you and your kids or your friends' kids, names, addresses, email addresses, life events. Think about the about the things that might be in some kind of a religious organization's newsletters. Um, congratulations, our congregation sends warm wishes to so and so and so and so who on the birth of their child so and so on this date at this time, maybe to grandparents of this. We can get familial information. We can find other information, deaths of marriages, other life events. And some of the places online that collect and store and allow people to access open source, these, these um, open source intelligence, like, um, I'm sorry, places that allow us to access these documents, uh, they many times don't restrict who has access to them. So people around the world can collect this information. To complicate the matter, we have disinformation. We have computers out there that are making pictures of people that never, ever existed. In my day, back when I was a kid, when we looked on the internet and we saw a picture of somebody doing something, we knew that somewhere in the world there was a person doing that thing because computers weren't as sophisticated as they are now. Now we have sites like the one here on the left, thispersondoesnotexist.com, where a generative adversarial network of computers will generate what it thinks a human face looks like. And then there's other computers that go, no, that's not right, that's not right. Ooh, that one's good. And they promote it so that you can then see it. And if you go to thispersondoesnotexist.com and you refresh your browser and refresh your browser, each one of those pictures that comes up will be of a person that um, will be will be of the person that has never actually existed. They are made up. Now we can identify right now the the pictures are not good enough that we can't identify that these pictures are um, are generated by computers, but there will come a time when you'll look at a picture or you'll look at a video like the one on the right and you'll go, yeah, that looks real enough. Do I and did a computer make it too? And you know, there are these things called deep fakes, where actors like Jordan Peele that can do a really good impersonation of President Obama, um, he can do the audio, and then people will sync up his audio with Obama's lips and make it look like Obama is saying what Jordan Peele said. These videos are extremely convincing nowadays, and they're going to be easier and easier to make. And so the information that's out there could be stuff that we we really haven't ever seen before and has never actually occurred. In the old days, to find out what where I was going, what I was doing, um, who I was doing it with, what I was buying, you'd have to dumpster dive. You'd come to my house, find my house, come to my house, go through my trash. But nowadays, we push so much information to the internet through our social apps and through our mobile devices that it's trivial many times to identify people and what they do. Hi, everybody. My name is Michael Hoffman, and I am the author and instructor, lead instructor for the SEC 487 class at SANS. Um, at SANS, uh, we have a number of different classes, but the only OSINT class right now, open source intelligence class, is mine. Now, I also have a consultancy that I run called Spotlight InfoSec, and more importantly, is a nonprofit organization that I created called OSINT Curious. That's OSINTCurio.us. And I tell you that that's very important because if you want one place to go to learn about open source intelligence, what it is, why it matters, how you can do it, 
that's the place. We give away free information, yay! Um, that is uh, blog posts, videos that are 10 minutes long, um, just really neat things. And it's not just me writing it. There's a, some really world-class people that help out. I also been in cybersecurity for a long time. I used, I've been teaching for SANS for over six years now, and I used to teach the web app at hacking class 542. Most importantly, I have a psychology degree. Yes, it's not in computer science or any of those standard type of normal things. My pathway into cybersecurity and OSINT has been a really twisted one, which I will save for a later date. Because what I want to do is, see, we're at the end of the slides already. I told you I only had a few slides. What I want to do is tell you a little bit about open source intelligence, and then we're going to work our way through a lot of different topic areas within the field. I want to give you this kind of sampler platter for things that might not be in Google. Because let's face it, when, some, when I go and I tell somebody, I do open source intelligence, if they know what that means, they probably say to me, oh, you mean fancy Googling. Yeah, 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 we use Google, of course, but we also use other search engines. We use different tools and techniques to retrieve information. Open source intelligence in general is, is, is the gathering of data from a resource that's open or publicly available, uh, whether that in our case is the internet or whether it's something like a newspaper or radio station that's transmitting or a television station. Each of those sources can provide us with really good information about something that's happening, but that's just information or data. What we need to do is take that information and then analyze it, think it through, um, verify and validate it to make sure that it actually happened or, or is, is not propaganda or not something that has been falsified. And then we use that information to answer a question, usually the questions of our customer. Hey, who is the, the person behind the attack on our website? Uh, where did my spouse go on such and such day? How do I find more people in cybersecurity, uh, if I, if I, where are they? All of these questions and more can be answered with open source intelligence. And the reality is, is that most people out there do some kind of open source intelligence. They just don't call it OSINT. I was talking to a recruiter and I, I conveyed this to a group of people that I talk, spoke to earlier today. I, I talked to a, a recruiter at an organization and I said to her, how do you find people on the internet? And she, she did that Mr. Incredibles thing from the movies The Incredibles where he kind of looked left, he looked right. He's like, all right, I can get in a lot of trouble for telling you this, but, and she said, we use Boolean searches. I was like, okay, what's a Boolean search? She says, well, you, you go to Google, you type in quote, penetration tester, quote, or quote, cybersecurity analyst. I'm like, oh, you're doing Google Dork. She says, no, 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 we're doing Boolean searches. Ah, well, you're also doing open source intelligence. And we use open source intelligence to answer a huge variety of questions from business things, cyber things, even personal things. And what I want to do now is kind of show you some of those things. Now, I'm going to go through a bunch of websites and what I'm, I will do after this talk is I will post on my website, which is da, 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 webbreacher.com. This is my personal website. I will post a blog post that's similar to the one there, that 2020 SANS at Mike moving past Googling. That's from a previous talk I gave. I will post all of the URLs that I'm going to go through into a post right after this. So you all can just go to that website, click, and you'll have all the URLs. Cool? That's webbreacher.com. So the first website I want to show you is how do we learn about open source intelligence? What's out there? OSINT Curious is going to be a really good bet. As I mentioned, we have uh, blog posts that show you how to scrape data, how to analyze data, um, thing, how to gra grab information from Facebook. If you're somebody that's like, oh, you know what? I really wish I could do better searches in Facebook to find 
my high school sweetheart or the person that's, you know, uh, bullying my child. Check it out. We provide you a whole bunch of resources from Instagram, Facebook, and more. There's the 10 minute tips over here also. The 10 minute tips will show you 10 minute long videos. We have a whole channel on YouTube. We have many, many, many here that uh, you can just watch. They're 10 minutes long or less and they show a discrete skill or tool. The next thing I wanna bring you to is the, where are all the resources? If we're not gonna use Google, if we're not gonna use Bing or DuckDuckGo or Yandex, these other search engines, I need to know where all the websites are on the internet. While this site doesn't give you quite that much information, this Start Me page or bookmark page uh, made by Bruno Mortier over in Europe has a, a lot of URLs that are well categorized. And that's all this is, there's no magic here. He's got a whole bunch of URLs that he's categorized according to things like OSINT frameworks and resources or search engines and stuff. And he has all of these other types of uh, resources as well. He even links to other people that have pages that do this. Like in the middle of his page here, he has OSINT framework by Justin Nordeen and all these other pages that'll give you even more URLs that you can go to achieve your OSINT goals, whether it's finding people, or IPs, businesses, whatever. And he's over in Europe, and this is uh, focused not just in the United States, but on targets outside of here as well. Now the, target, the, the title of this talk is Moving Beyond Googling It. And I wanna show you one of the main reasons why in open source intelligence, we don't just rely on search engines. Oh sure, we, we do our scans, we do our, our um, searches and stuff, but we don't rely on them totally because we know that only about 10%, 10 to 12% of the internet is indexed by search engines. 10 to 12%, that's not a lot. And most of it is unlinked resources or unscanned resources by the search engines. And one of the reasons why a website might not be scanned or, or indexed in Google, well, it's from a really interesting little file that might appear at the root of the domain. Here I've gone to, and you can follow along with me. I'm sure you figured that out, that you could launch a browser and go to all these sites. I'm, I'm using very few sites that require extra access, and I'll tell you when I do. CNN.com slash robots.txt. Now, those of you that are in pen testing or have done web development or web uh, site management know that the robots.txt file is a text file that stays at the root level of a domain and they're found all over the internet. The idea here is that web administrators can tell Google, DuckDuckGo, Bing, Yandex, those search engines, hey, when you get to our site, don't go in those directories. And that's what we see here. For CNN, here we have user agent star that says all web spiders don't go into these directories. And some of the directories are quite interesting here. You probably have already seen this. Look at this, there's a slash AOL directory. Yeah, America Online, still going strong 30 years later. How about this? Would you be interested in what's in the beta directory for CNN? Is that like tomorrow's news that they're just testing out or something or new format for their website or new features? I don't know. But we know that Google, Bing, DuckDuckGo, Yandex, these search engines are not going to have slash AOL in their indexes because CNN has asked them to not index that content. But we know it's there. What would stop us from going to cnn.com slash AOL, cnn.com slash beta slash, slash uh, CNN beta? Would nothing. We can just add that to our browser and go there. Now, here's the thing. These robots.txt files may have historical data. So that slash AOL directory entry right there, that may be a remnant from 30 years ago. And when somebody said, yeah, we got to put this in the robots.txt and nobody has ever told the system administrator to remove it because that directory doesn't exist. So 
it doesn't necessarily mean that there is something there. It just means that there could be, and it won't appear in the search engines. Now, let's take a look at another website. You might know this small vendor. It's Cisco, cisco.com. Again, cisco.com slash robots.txt. Text file that's out there, you grab it and you look at it. Now, Cisco's is interesting because it's more corporate. I used to work for a, a company that, that did consulting for many years and we always had to justify and put in reasons why we did anything. And then those were kept with whatever we did so that the next person down the line would know why these things are in there. Well, in the robots.txt, we can put comments. And you see Cisco does that, like here. The slash bug navigator is bug data. Well, I kind of guessed that from the title. But check this out. We don't want the Cisco Googlebot Enterprise from going in the slash jobs directory because there's a temporary entry per performance team. So if a spider or automated tool hits the job directory, Cisco.com's website will have a performance issue. Is that what they're telling me here? Because I think they've just told me how to do a denial of service against their site. Now, to be honest, I, I mean, I'm not advocating that, but these are the things we can learn. And to be honest, the temporary entry has been in there for over a year now. Again, sometimes things go in, but they don't come out of the, um, jo the uh, robots.txt file. What's interesting about this um, is that I've been giving talks like this for a while, and what I find is that these robots.txt files sometimes change. For instance, if we scroll all the way to the bottom, you'll see the last one is user agent Yandex. Disallow global RU. Well, RU is the top level domain or the, the, the code for Russia. Why would they disallow Yandex, a Russian search engine, from indexing Russian content on Cisco.com. Kind of doesn't make sense, right? Hmm. Look below that too. We have all changes to robots.tech need to be approved by search SEO and site at Cisco.com. Nice. Now, it didn't always say that. Up until probably about two months ago, it had a person's name there. And it said, hey, contact this person who's in charge of all of this stuff, which if you're into, if you're doing open source intelligence for reconnaissance for social engineering attacks, knowing a person inside that organization and their email and what their job responsibility is, is a really good pretext to have. Let's finally look at the robots.txt file for apple.com. Now, you get the idea of what's in here, but I wanna show you that reason why not only do we not just use Google when we're doing searches, but we use multiple search engines. We, we use Google, Bing, DuckDuckGo, and Yandex because each of them could have a different perspective on what's on individual sites. Let's take a look at this. So here we have the robots.txt, which you're now comfortable with here. It says no user agents, no good spiders should go in these directories. All right. So that means all of those, those spiders from Google, Bing, DuckDuckGo, Yandex are not going to go into those directories. But if we scroll down just a little bit, we see a different user agent there, Baidu Spider. Now Baidu is a search engine over in Asia. So what, what Apple has done is said, listen, no spider can go in these directories and Baidu spider over in China, you specifically cannot get into these. So let's say that you are uh, using Asian search engine you know, like Baidu and you're doing maybe just shopping over in, in China. When you do a certain queries, it's not going to pull some data that is on the Apple website because Baidu doesn't have it. And there's other ones here too. Um, if we scroll down, we see the Haosau. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right, but another Asian uh, web search engine is not going to have certain information. But if you use Google, Bing, DuckDuckGo, or Yandex, it does. And so we move beyond just Googling it and sometimes use a whole bunch of different search engines to find content. 
A large part of what many OSINTERs do is open source intelligence on people. We need to find where people are, find what they're talking about, who they're talking about it with, where they're talking about it, uh, what the content is. All of those things are important because we might be looking for credit cards that are being stolen and sold or, or terrorists that are planning an upcoming attack and getting in there where these people are located and finding what they're talking about is very important to the health, safety, and welfare of other people. There's other reasons for using uh, social media. And one of those is that by using some of the social media that allows people to geolocate themselves, you know, tell people where they are, hey, I'm right here at this place and I, I love the view here. And click, take a picture, post it, and tag the location. When that happens, we can get remote, recon we can do remote reconnaissance from wherever we are. For instance, during protests, riots, during natural disasters or uprisings, we can find people that are located in whatever country and see on certain platforms what they're posting. And sometimes we can get firsthand accounts of whatever it is that's happening. And we've used this time and time again to find out what's going on in certain areas that have been ravaged by hurricane or floods or what's going on during a protest or what's happening on a Wednesday night in a place in the Middle East. I mean, any of these things can happen. Now, this is the risky part of the, the talk is that I don't know what's going to appear when I click these, but I want to show you what can actually come up on these. I'm on a social media platform called Snapchat. And what Snapchat normally is, is me sending a message to you. And when I send a message to you, uh, you actually get the message. And once you read that message, the message disappears in about 10 seconds or so. Cool, we, we kind of can converse back and forth with pictures or videos, but I can also take a video or a picture and then post it to my story and make it public. When I do that, it might be tagged to the location where I took that picture or did that video. Now picture this, what if you're in a location like mm, inside your office and somebody does a snap of whatever inside your office and posts that to the internet for 24 hours? They could capture your information about your, your security systems, your guards, badges, um, and many, many other things that probably should not be out there on social media. I do not and you do not have to authenticate to see those public posts from people. Here, I've gone to map.snapchat.com and you're welcome to do it. I warn you, there is sound to a lot of these. So if you do this at home, turn your speaker volume down um, or do it you know, on another system after I'm done talking um, because you never know what you're gonna get. I did this in... Um, I did this at a talk in Atlanta, Georgia, and I did one of those things where I like hit the snap and, and what happened here, I'm in Saudi Arabia right now, um, and I just click on these little heat map things and these videos come up and you might not really get a good feel for this. Let's see, let's go to the next one. Hang on, let's, let's go to a different area. So it actually loads up stuff. How about Tripoli? Ooh, Benghazi, seriously? Let's see what's happening in Benghazi. So you get the videos of what's happening. Now this person's driving really slowly, stuck in traffic. There's a license plate. Can you read the license plate? These are things that get released in these, you know, things that normally would be filtered and, and screened out. You also can get nauseous from these videos too. All right, let's see if there's another one over here in Benghazi. Oh, there we go. Now, sometimes people will tag who they are in the pictures. Like here we have MK, uh, um, M whatever his, his username was, we have that. But in, in Snap, we don't see the usernames normally and it's not in the traffic, unfortunately. So tying this video back to a certain person is a little bit more challenging unless we get some identifying information released in the video. Now, what I did in Atlanta was I had something like this going and I was talking about what it means and all. And, and what I did was I turned around, I was like, yeah, and this, uh, 
it, it, you, what if this was inside of your place of work? You know, we see these pictures and these videos, and it was a picture of a person at a nightclub that was walking towards a stage with a pole in the middle. It's like, no. So you never know what you're going to see. Now, this is the middle of the night over there, so that might not be a great place to go. But these snaps are all over the world. Let's see what's happening in California real quick. Los Angeles. Here we go. Four minutes ago. Somebody, oh, there's a fire. Ah, this person's playing pandemic, pin the tail on the zombie, it looks like, or something. You get the idea. Now, one of the things that we need to do a lot of times is say, hey, I saw that Fuzzy Bunny 123 uh, was the user that posted this video or whatever their username is. And we need to look at it across a whole bunch of sites. I need to find all the places on the internet where Fuzzy Bunny 123 had an account. Well, you could visit Twitter and try to do a search and then visit Instagram, try to do a search. That's not very efficient. So what I'm gonna introduce you now to, it, what I'm gonna introduce you to right now is a project that I, that I worked on and OSINT Combine, a very talented coder and OSINT are over in Australia named Chris Poulter, webified. It's a What's My Name project. So let's picture this let's say you're a digital forensics person and you've dumped somebody's phone and you've gotten a bunch of usernames or you're a pen tester and you found out that the developer of some web app is such and such you take their username and you put it into the search username now i'm just going to pick a random username here let's do fuzzy bunny and what we can do is search for that name now, when I hit go, what happens is my browser makes 194 requests out to the internet asking a variety of websites, hey, do you have Fuzzy Bunny as a user? Do you have Fuzzy Bunny as a user? And then what comes back are the results. Now, there are other websites that do this, but the way that they do it is not as transparent and not as secure as the way this app does it. Everything here happens in your browser. Nothing's being sent to my system, my, my server. I'm not collecting anything. I don't even collect who visits the site. It's just out there. And picture this. I mean, you have five, at, five names to run. You can run those in under 30 seconds. Collect the information, save it off, and keep going. And then to visit these things, I have no idea who Fuzzy Bunny is, but they've got a GitHub page. And if I open this up, I see here's their user ID. Here's other information about their account. Um, here's Pastebin. Here's Discus, Gravatar. Now the next step might be looking at those accounts and seeing, or the, at the profiles and finding out, is that my Fuzzy Bunny on the site or is it just somebody else with the Fuzzy Bunny name? I do want to warn you real quick before, I know some of you are like, what did he mean, warn me? Um, this website uh, does make your browser request out to places that might have pornography or do have pornography on them and the reason is is that one of the scenarios that we use tools like this on is to find out if a person has a public username like fuzzy bunny on twitter and they're tweeting out whatever it is that they normally tweet out there and then also use that same username You, in case you use this on your work network and you get some network people saying, hey, why are you visiting Pornhub? I'm not. Well, if you hit the go button here and don't filter what sites are actually requested by category, then you actually are trying to get to those sites. The other reason why this is important is, is one, to understand how your tools work. And in the SEC 487 class that I teach, we go through a lot of trouble to help people understand how the tools work instead of just run this tool, it gets you that, run this tool, it gets you that. Because if we understand how the tools and how the sites work, then we can go ahead and modify those or use them more effectively. So in this case, 
Um, one of the challenges of running this within like a corporate environment would be one, you'd be visiting or trying to visit Pornhub and some other uh, pornography websites. But the second thing is, what if instead of the, the web filters that you usually have to go through, what if instead of them blocking your traffic and presenting you a warning that, hey, you tried to visit a porn website, what if they just quietly dropped the response and the requests and didn't allow them to go through? When you get responses back, it's going to say, nope, uh, I didn't get anything from Pornhub. There must not be some, uh, there must not be a, an account there. But there actually might be an account there. Your request never went out. That's a false negative, and that is one of the other reasons why we use tools like this with clean internet connections, with a, a MiFi device or something else without web filtering. Because if we do filter the web traffic, then we might not see all of the things that we need to see. So, while we are on the topic of social media, Let's talk about beer. Those of you that have been to my talks before, you know I like beer. I, I do. I like talking about beer, and, I, and it fascinates me, the social media that's around beer drinkers. You see, the, the beer site untapped.com allows people to put a mobile app on their phone, then go out, get beer, take a picture of the beer, say, oh, it has hints of hops and honey or whatever it is, post that up to the website and say, I drank this beer with these people at this location at this date and time. And the last 25 posts of somebody with a non-private account are available to anybody, even without authentication. Now, as I told a group this morning um, on Control-Alt-Delete by Heather Mahalik, uh, I told them that I was watching Phil Hagen's Twitter feed one day and he kept posting out like, I'm the, I earned a badge for the most porters drank in Singapore. And I said to him, I was like, why are you telling me your drinking behavior? And he said something that, that to this day is something that I really, um, I, I love because it, it's one of those motivators. He said, what's the worst that somebody can do with it? Challenge accepted. So. I started looking into Untapped back in 2016, and I wrote a tool I'm going to show you. Well, recently, Bellingcat, an investigative journalist outfit, did a report. Um, actually, it was just Monday they did the report. They looked at Untapped a little differently. They looked at it with the mindset of what are people sharing in pictures, and can we track people like military people if we know that there's a an officers club at a certain base. Could we look at the people that are actually logging drinks at that base and then track where those people go? And the answer absolutely is yes, if somebody has a public account on Untapped. You know how I know? Because I made a tool. Yeah, let's just take a really quick look. I'm going to give you a, get you into the mindset. This is open source intelligence. It requires no account to get to Untapped and to read all this data. When I see all this rich data, being pushed to me, I start thinking, what could somebody do with this data? Well, watch. So this is a place in England, um, and this is typically what we find. This is a location. Here we have Jamie C. I'm just going to right-click and open these. Jamie C. is drinking some type of smooth tropical smoothie IPA. I guess that's good. Um, made by this company uh, at Untapped at Home. So it looks like she might be drinking it at home. Um, and then we also have the time, which here says an hour ago, but in the source code of the page, it actually has a date time stamp. That an hour ago is JavaScript that takes the absolute date time that we can harvest from the page and makes it human niceable, nice. So let's take a look at some of these other Maxine. Joshua H. All right, let's just take a look at them. All right, so the Joshua H.'s profile page, his name is actually Eskimo Pence, and he's got 1,800 beers that he has reported. And we say reported, 
because I have no idea if Joshua drank any of these beers, right? This is social media where people can lie. Yeah. Um, and Joshua, I have no idea if that's even his real name. But we do know that 1,870 times he has logged a beer here to Untapped. Let's see if Jamie, oh, uh, Jamie only has 271, and Maxine, 1344. Let's go ahead and stick with Joshua because he's our big winner. Now, this is a pro public profile, meaning that he hasn't restricted any access. By default, guess what? All profiles on Untapped are public. If you have an untapped profile, make it private. I won't be able to do any of the things I'm going to show you here. And other people won't be able to also. So let's take a look at this. So we already saw things like where he's drinking, and we saw what he's drinking here. Um, let's just go ahead and see if we can harvest this data. Now, to do this, we can do it in two ways. One, if you're a command line junkie, I've got a Python script that is free on my GitHub site, uh, github.com slash webbreacher slash untapped scraper. If you're a person that likes web pages and the easy way, let me show you a great site that Brandon Evans and Wes Braga, who may be on the WebEx right now listening in, they webified my Python script. All we have to do is copy the username here, copy that. We paste it into untapped scraper. Now this one's on Brandon's website. I'll put the URL again in the in the blog post I'm gonna make and I'll post it on webreacher.com. But here, all we have to do is paste in the username. Now you might notice that I've filled in this section over here. This is an API key that's optional. It's optional and I love it. This is the only part that's kind of paid in this. We can get all this really good data about this target. Well, let's take a look. Let's look in the, in the, um, doo -doo -doo -doo. this is the Python script. When I run it, it will go through and make a bunch of web calls. Oh, so sad, messed up. All right, it'll make a bunch of web calls to untapped live demos is risky we know that give me some credit um it'll make a bunch of web calls and it tells you hey look here's 1870 beers we saw that before here it went out to this location and got his friends accounts social networks are social and they make us connect to other people because of that we can now collect his friends, then we can pivot to their profiles, and if they're public, we can collect their friends and their friends' friends, and so on and so on, and map out a huge network of people. Now, since there's absolute time, date and time stamps on these, we can look at the days of the week, the hours of the day when he's recorded his last 25 beers. Now, we don't necessarily know that he drank the beer, then went on untapped. Sometimes people will drink the beers, and then the next morning they'll go, yeah, I had this one, then this one, then this one. So, you know, there's a lot of fud, fudging that are fud, fudge factor for the, the times of these. And that's another thing. When we're doing open source intelligence, there's a lot of analysis that goes into why this is or is not this way. The last 25 beers were logged by this user around the 8 o'clock to 1 a.m. And the last uh, 25 beers were logged on these days of the month. All right, let's take this user and go into the untapped scraper and paste it in there. Now I'm hoping that this is gonna work just fine for us and pull back a really nice looking page in three, two, one, and there you have it. Ah, oh, it was one second off, darn it. You can see the content here. It's, it's very similar to what we saw before, right? We have 1870 beers. Here's the recent activity of the user. Oh, was logging beers as recently as today. Nice. Here's the places that they drank. And we can click on check-ins because Wes and, and Brandon did such a great job, we can sort this and look, look, un, untapped at home, that's probably, he's drinking beers at home because of the quarantine. Um, uh, that is a 96 beers that he's logged. And there's the first date and the last date when he's logged it. 
but we have other places too like huh trip by Wyndham in Dubai do you think that might be a hotel where he drank at the hotel bar and logged it yeah hold on to that because we're gonna come back to that in just a moment now, as we scroll down, we can see all the different beers that he's drank and when he drank them. But this is the beauty of the actual uh, application. And that's if those, um, if since those places where he's checked in are physical locations on Earth, we can ask Google, that's what that API key is up here. Um, we can ask Google, hey, take this address and give me the latitude and longitude. And then we plotted in a heat map here where you can look at where he's drank. Let's see if there's anything. Oh, ha ha, we were zoomed in too far. Ooh, remember that Dubai hotel? Yeah, right over here. One beer logged over there. In America, 96 beers logged at untapped at home. Yeah, okay, so that that's the, but if you had to look at this and guess where this person, Joshua's from, I bet you'd guess England, right? Yeah, in fact, we can, if I would just scroll in like this, we can scroll in and see, huh, yeah, it looks like a pretty well dispersed. There's not like a really big heat area there for his drinking. We're going to come back to this in just a moment. But these are the other things. Here's drinking pattern, day of the week, hour of the day, etc. Really cool, only works with public profiles. And when I showed this to one of my students for my SEC 47 class, they said, that's nice, Micah, but could you, instead of watching a person, could you watch a location and tell me all the people that log drinks at that bar long, uh, across time? I was like, yeah, I can do that. So I made another tool and let me show you its output. See, I figured out that one of the places where people drink beer is at airports. So since December 2019, I have been recording when people log beers at over 70 different international airports around the world. You see everything from Budapest to Raleigh, Durham to San Diego, a bunch of them are in here. And I have a database of those people when they logged a beer at what airport. And what we can do with this data is track where people go in the world. Yeah, we also can track quarantine because guess what happened? When quarantines went into effect, my numbers went down because I'm only watching airports here and people weren't drinking at airports as much, as much. But what, we, what I've done here is I've collected this information. Here we have username information. Now, all of this was just done with a Python script that just once a day grabs information from a website and stores it over time. We do this all the time in OSINT. We might do it with Twitter profiles or other things, but looking at that data in aggregation yields some amazing types of, um, of uh, data analysis trends. Let's take a look. I'm going to scroll down to my buddy Mogford, but you can see this. Look, you can see that there are people here, accounts, Amethyst Heels, that has been to Irving, Texas. Oh, this is March 26. Wow. It seems like once a minute they logged a beer. Maybe it was a beer tasting thing. I don't know. Maybe it was just a really hard day of travel. But let's go ahead and just scroll down here. All right, I went too far. All right, I just wanna get down to a place that has, oh, let's just search for this guy. So there's a, there's a user that I know that's good. His name is Mogford. This is Mogford's uh, log drinking behavior in airports, not all of it, but this is all the airports that he's logged a beer at in different places and it has to be logged at the airport itself it can't be like at this restaurant at that airport it has to be at that airport we can see that in 17 january he was in boston then 29 january salt lake then 31 january atlanta this is kind of interesting we can see all the different places this is a person that travels a lot maybe they are a flight attendant or a pilot or maybe there's somebody else that works on planes and travels a lot or a salesperson. The most interesting thing for me is this. 
let's go down here to the bottom. See the last entry here, the last airport that they logged? Miami International. Well, let's go back over to our untapped scraper, type in Mogford, oh, Mogford, and scrape his data and see, okay, from the airport on the 17th of May, where did they go from there? Maybe we can find the real world location of this person based upon their self reported drinking behaviors. And in three, two, Ah, uh, one second too fast that time. All right, let's take a look at this. Let's go up and we can see the recent activity here. Huh. So there's the Miami International Airport. And then look where they went. Houston Marriott North. That's probably Houston, Texas, would you say? Yeah. So they went to Miami and then they didn't drink anymore in the Miami airport, which doesn't even show up here, but we see that they drank here in Houston. Now, you'll also see for this user, whole bunch of hotspots. This person has in the last 25, no, actually, this is their entire reported um, information of all of their drinking behaviors. Uh, you could see clusters there, which might indicate that they live in one place, work in the other, um, and we can zoom in here as well. I think you get the idea. Is that based upon their drinking behaviors, we can do this. So to circle back, I showed Phil Hagen this type of thing uh, from the Python script. And uh, after seeing what I could do with it, he made his account private. Yes, securing the internet. But you know what, sometimes it's not the information that we leak that can be so damaging. For instance, how many of you, just raise your hand right now if you're an Xfinity customer. Uh, for your cable. Yeah, for your internet as well. Because if you're an Xfinity customer for your internet and for your TV, then you might be on this map. See, this is a map of the Xfinity Wi-Fi networks across the United States. And what they do is they've created this mesh network where you can just roam from, from uh, their site to their site. Well, their site is really your house and your neighbor's house and the person down the street's house that is broadcasting Xfinity Wi-Fi. Your phone, if you have that service, will, will connect to it. And that's good because you get free internet, right? Well, what it also tells us is, let's just zoom in here. I happen to be in Kansas City. Let's find us some, oh, here's some Xfinity users. I have no idea where this is. So let's just see if it actually comes up with something. There we go, we got four users right there on East 315th Street. Now, if we were to take this location and put it in Google Maps, turn on the satellite view, would this be an apartment building? I don't know. Could this be your house? Perhaps. We see a whole bunch of, let's see, a whole bunch of, there we go. Let's go up here to Peculiar. There we go. So there you go. So these are Xfinity Wi-Fi saying, hey, I'm in this house, which tells me automatically who your internet provider is. Does this matter? It depends. It really does. It depends on what I need that data for. Now, I know that um, I'm running a little, sh not short on time, but I am r uh, running a little bit short. Um, I do notice too that some people said that this was supposed to start at eight, um, but uh, at eight thirty. Um, I hope if you're okay, I'll go just a little bit long. If you need to pop off, that's cool. We're gonna be. This is all recorded. Um, I will give the GitHub reference. Yes, Mike. And um, oh, so somebody else thought thought it was supposed to start at eight thirty. Okay. Oh, it did start at eight thirty officially. Jeez. Well, then we've got another half hour. Yes. All right. So let's take a look at this. Let's go ahead and take a look at some more stuff. Now, some of you don't necessarily care about <laughs> Xfinity. Some of you don't care about people. I'm not like that. I mean, you care about people, but you're not looking at people for OSINT. Maybe what you're interested in is in domain names. Now, there's some really cool things we can do with domain names. 
there is this system called the WHOIS database, and it's a series of databases that really records who registered for a certain domain name at a certain date at a certain time, and I'm sorry, a certain date, and what's their email address, their phone number, and other information about them. And before GDPR hit in Europe in 2000 last year, actually 2018, and, and before it started to be enforced, we could just query who is and say who is sans.org and it would give us Alan Paller's name and Sans's address and Sans's email address and phone number and we could collect that and then we could go on our merry way and and do more with that information if we needed to reach out and contact them because they're sending e, uh, spam or hosting malware we could go ahead and let them know but when GDPR hit and started to go into enforcing enforcement mode in May of 2018, what happened was the maintainers of these databases, they had no idea who was an EU citizen that had personal information in their databases. So what they had to do was they had to mask all of the information. They weren't gonna delete the information. It was just, it's just against the rules, the GDPR rules, to share that information without the consent of, uh, collect and share without the consent of the, the EU citizen. Well, because they wanted the domains, there was kind of consent there to collect that information. They need that information, the registrars do, but sharing it is not something they were willing to do. So as many of you in, in defense know, you cannot just query the WHOIS database anymore. It shows you just filtered stuff in some cases, but we still can do stuff with the data in there. See, we can't just say who is sans.org and have them tell us Alan Paller and here's his home phone number and here's his email address and here's his physical address. They won't do that. But if we play a guessing game, we can say, listen, I know you can't tell me the person or the email, but what if I gave you an email? Could you tell me what domains it owns? Well, there's nothing sensitive about that. And so we can do these reverse who is lookups. And sometimes they're really, really useful. Now, one of the things that we can do is we can not just ask for a certain person, like, let's just go ahead and do this. Um, we're going to do John Doe at example.com. I'm not sure that there is a John Doe. Oh, there is. Yay. John Doe at example.com is an email address. That's tagged to the registration, yourdomainoftest.com. Cool. We asked for an email. It gave it to us. Now, if I know of a certain organization, asking for individual emails in these search engines is going to be kind of annoying. It's going to be slow. You know, if I had to ask for Mike at sans.org and Alan at sans.org, that's going to be inefficient. So let's use a wild card and let's ask of UDNS.info, one of my favorite, favorite sites for this, to give us any domains and dates when they were registered and where they were registered. Give us that information for a wild card at a certain email. So if I entered in here at apple.com, what it will do is it'll tell me, hey, I know apple.com. There are 12,016 domains that ViewDNS has access to that have an at apple.com email address somewhere in the record. Now, we don't have the Micah at apple.com and Alan at apple.com. We don't know what those emails are yet. But we do get this information. And this information, now, ViewDNS info, just so you know, Great site. I really like them. I don't make any money off of like pimp pimping them or anything like that. Um, they do have an API there. If you are interested in doing this like professionally, you'll notice that I'm only getting the first 500 results. It says so right here, 500 results. If you regularly do this with domains above um, 500, buy the API. You can send some really quick requests to them. And for like 20 or 30 or 50 dollars and i think it's like 30 dollars per month you can get access to it don't get this full report now for 200 dollars. skip that go with the api 
So let's take a look at what we can learn here from open source intelligence. We've only got a portion of the records, but what I'm gonna show you now is a really neat technique using free tools. This free, these free tools are going to scrape this data out of this HTML table and put it into a CSV for me. Then I'm gonna take that CSV and put it into something that's like a cluster uh, relationship mapping application to allow me to see common linked objects. Because see, what we can do is we can see that CSC Corporate Domains here and CSC Corporate Domains Inc. Uh, are, are frequently um, used as a registrar for Apple.com. But let's take a look at this visually and see if things pop out. So let me show you a technique. And if you have questions about this technique, there's a 10-minute tip on the OSINT Curious website which uh, has all of this in it. In fact, that first blog post on OSINT Curious has this. So let's take a look at how we do this. The first thing I'm gonna use is this Instant Data Scraper plugin. Now it's just for Google Chrome. What it does is it looks for HTML tables, any HTML tables. It is an amazing, amazing tool for free. You put it in your browser, it looks for an HTML table as it found here, it says, hey, I see the domain name column, I see a creation date column, and a registrar column. Is that what you wanted me to scrape? Yes, yes it is. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit CSV. It will save this to wherever I normally save things as a CSV. And that part's done. Now let's go to the visualization tool. Some of you pen testers or other people out there, you might know about Multigo, you might know about i2 Analyst Notebook, Tableau, Gephi, all of those tools are absolutely something that you could import in a CSV and look at relationships. I'm not gonna use any of those. I'm gonna use a web page because my buddy, Chris Poulter, uh, OSINT Combine, created and released this osyncombine.com slash data-visualization-tool. And what we can do with it is within our browser, open the tool, and then Upload a CSV, we're gonna do that. We're gonna find that CSV I just did. What it's gonna do is it's gonna look for common nodes. So all of those CSC corporate domains, it's gonna to clump together and say, hey, all these domains all registered for this at the same place. Now, this looks a little bit weird right now, but you see CSC corporate domain right here, and all of those domains, all of these domains over here, are registered with that domain registrar. And this is something that's commonly found. Apple.com probably has a big, big contract with CSC corporate domains that they will do all their official email uh, domain name registrations with CSC corporate domains. Now, there's a bigger one over here. Let's zoom in here. Oh, we see another one, CSC corporate domains. That looks like it has an ink on the end. You might not be able to see it, but trust me here. It does. It's just a misspelling or a typo in the um, in the registrar. We saw on the previous page over here that some of the domains had CSC corporate domains. Some were put in with CSC corporate domains, comma incorporated. Sometimes it's even corporation service company instead of CSC. These are all the same entity as far as we're concerned. And we could normalize the data in the CSV. But let's just take a look at this because what we can do is use a little psychology. If Apple, if we assume that Apple has a contract with CSC corporate domains to do all their domain registrations, then we can assume that most of these domains that are clustered to CSC corporate domains are official Apple domains. What if we looked at the ones that are not linked to a CSC corporate domains? We might find some rogue domains that were registered by employees, or personal domains. Let's take a look. Now I have no idea what this is gonna show, but I do see, ha ha, there she is. What is this? This is a registrar named register.com. And on uh, 2017, February 9th, anjellyshick.com was registered to that domain. And there's an at apple.com email that's associated with that 
domain. That's where we got the data from, right? But that doesn't look like an official Apple registrar or domain. What might it be? Somebody using their work email for business uh, for personal reasons. And we see this over and over again. In fact, if we come back over here, let me just show you a, an excellent example. If we do at dhs.gov, we can look at the domains here, and I'm not going to go through the exercise again, because you can tell that most of these domains are not official dhs.gov domains, right? BostonJuniorHuskies.com, CrossFit Pistoleros, those, those are not official DHS domains. What they are is people that work for DHS that use their work email to register personal domains. Now, those two techniques of doing the reverse uh, who is and using the wild cards and also doing the cluster analysis are things we do all the times. We look at this and we go, why is this that way? Oh, and then we can do research. We can figure out the exact reason why and understand the data better. With cluster analysis, that highlights sometimes those anomalous bits of data that allow us to break open a case or allow us to um, go ahead and identify some rogue things that, sh that are not as they should be. These things are very common in, in the world that we live in. Now, I will go ahead and do my last part here. Just for those of you that joined at eight, cool. For those that are joined late, cool too, because we're gonna do some more fun things. Open source intelligence is fun. This is, I mean, yes, there's a whole world that's depressing and very serious and tracking terrorists and people that are being abused and kidnapped and, and, and all those things, don't get me wrong. But the hunt is what a lot of us long for and thirst for. That hunt, that investigative spirit of, I wonder if I could do this. I wonder how I can grab that. That's what we like. That's what we really thirst after. And if you're somebody that asks questions like, why is it this way? And I wonder if I could do that. And open source intelligence may be an excellent field for you. Let's shift gears. Open source intelligence is not just about what's out there that you've pushed. We've already seen that. It's other in people that are collecting data about you and things. We also have places that collect information about breaches that have happened. Yeah, if you were in, if you were, uh, and you had an account on a website like LinkedIn, LinkedIn was broken into. Somebody stole a bunch of data from LinkedIn and pushed it up to the internet. We call that breach data. And sometimes in that breach data, we have names, addresses, phone numbers, uh, email addresses, credit card information, passwords. That information is then collected by a variety of people. I have a lot of cybersecurity friends, SANS instructors, that grab those breaches and store them locally on their computer so that they can, when they're gonna do a pen test, search through them. I know other people that grab those breaches and they store them to protect their, their uh, customers or to pr protect their employees. The question is, is it ethical to do that? See, there's a whole bunch of things you can do within the world of open source intelligence that you can do, but is it right to do? And is it legal to do? I'm not a lawyer. I'm not going to pretend to be. I'm not answering any legal questions. If, if you put something in the questions about, hey, is it legal? Mm -mm, not going to do it because I don't know the laws in Cambodia or Australia or Canada. Each country has their own laws. And then there's the ethics. The company that you work for might forbid you from doing it because think about this. What you're doing in some cases is paying for access to stolen data and then using it in your work. If I told you I stole a computer that I will let you use to do your work, you'd be like, no, man, that's a stolen computer. That's, I can't do that. But that's essentially what we're doing is when somebody else breaks in and steals breach data and releases that to the internet, some other company grabs it, puts it in their database, and then charges us for access, we're accessing stolen data. Is it ethical to do? That's something you're going to need to decide. 
you need to decide whether you're okay doing it and then make sure your employer is okay doing it before you do any of the things that I'm going to show you now. Because even though Micah Hoffman believes, yes, since the attackers have access to it, I should be able to leverage it too, because then I can inform my customer, hey, your data might be abused and you might start getting ransom emails or extortion emails saying, I've got a video of you touching yourself and here's a password so you know that I'm actually somebody that, that has something of yours and to gain your trust. Those emails have been going out for years. So even though I believe that it's okay to use this, my employer may not. And they may say, nope, you can't do it. So check before you do this professionally. Now, before we get into the actual accessing of breach data, which we can do in a variety of ways, I do wanna show you um, a site that you should probably already know about. It's called Have I Been Pwned? Have I Been Pwned is a, one of those good cybersecurity places that grabs the breach data, takes off those sensitive bits like passwords and all, and, gr and keeps the email addresses and says, oh, this email address was tied to this breach. And then they let you search for it, like here. If I type in any email address in the world, what? It's a valid email, don't you at me? We can see that, oh no, this email was found in 31 breaches and 33 pastes. And as we scroll down, we get data about what was in those breaches. We don't get the information that they found in those breaches. We just know Obama at whitehouse.gov was found in each of these, these collections or on some of these sites like Dropbox, Dubsmash, Ebony. Okay. What we do now is we can inform our customer or we can go and find those breaches, find that data out there. And when we do, we can then do other things. So the other thing that you should all do is the, click on this notify me up here. The notify me allows you to register your email so that if your email is ever found in a breach in the future, have I been pwned will send you an email and let you know, hey, sorry to ruin your day, but you were in that breach. That way you can change your password before attackers get a hold of the data and start using it against you. Now, Obama at whitehouse.gov. Let's go to a site. Now, I've paid for access to get into this site, dehashed.com. And again, this is the part where you need to look at ethics and legal legalities. I'm gonna search for Obama. Let's see, Obama at whitehouse.gov. I'm just gonna look for that Dropbox one. And what it, no, it makes me re-authenticate, come on. It's behind Cloudflare. And so Cloudflare likes to check that I'm a real person. Okay, let's try that again, Obama at whitehouse.gov, Dropbox. Yay, we found it. So we have Obama at whitehouse.gov, share this. Here's Obama.gov at Dropbox. Here's collections data. And you can see when I click on it, since I've authenticated and I've paid them money, they give me access to the password, which on this site was one, two, three, four, five, six. Thanks, Obama. Is this really Barack Obama's account or Michelle Obama's account? Probably not. This is probably just somebody using Obama at whitehouse.gov on a, on a site that does not require a verification of the ID. You know how I know? Well, let's take a look at Dropbox. Dropbox did not have clear text passwords. So what happened was in the breach, there's this hashed password. I copy the hashed password. Now, we tell our users, right, uh, the people that are at our work, make long, complicated passwords that are hard to remember and even harder for an attacker to compromise. That's awesome, because from my perspective, when your users create long, unique passwords, they can't remember them. And so what they do is they use that exact same password over and over and over again, right? Because it's long and strong. It's it's something that's secure. So of course I can use it on multiple sites. What's the risk there? 
here's the risk. Even without the password itself, well, let's try to crack the password. You know the fastest way to crack a password? I know you're thinking rainbow tables or hash cat. No, no, no. Google. Yep. Google's the fastest way because what we can do is paste our password, our password hash in there, click the button, and we can find that other people might have cracked it. In this case, there's one paste bin paste there, and that's just the one where this hash was found. So you could go over to paste bin and find the same data. But it doesn't look like it was cracked. It might be really strong and secure. So if it's long, strong and secure, if we take that password and search for it, or the password hash, and search for it, what we'll find is other accounts that have that exact same password hash. And you can see that they're all from Dropbox, which you can also see, it kind of looks like somebody just like mashed on the keyboard, right? I mean, these look kind of random names. Oh, and they look a little suspicious too, right? Last name at mail.com, please. Bruce Willis at hollywood.com, that's not even real. Hannibal at cannibal.com, all right, I, what is this? This is probably somebody that figured out that Dropbox wasn't validating emails at a certain point in time, made an account, got two gigs of data, put his really secure password on there, ran out of two gigs of space, made another account, did the same thing. Now, I could be wrong about that, but that's probably what happened. And we see that here. One of the other things I want to show you before we can go ahead and leave is that the information in these password databases is not just passwords from the English language. Let's go over here to translate. Let's translate the most secure password ever. Let, let's make it super secure. Password, password into Cyrillic, into Russian. That turns out to be parole, parole. And I'm going to copy that. I'm going to show you. that even people in Russia use bad passwords. Yeah, if we find people that use this password, then they probably know Russian, right? Which would also mean that they probably use mail.ru, yandex.ru email addresses. And in fact, that's what we're seeing here. Oh, this person was really secure. Parole, parole, parole. Three passwords, long passwords, right? Yeah. So the data in here is stuff that is, um, it is all, all uh, languages from around the world, and we can harvest that as well. So if you joined late, a couple of things for you, webbreacher.com, write that down, because I will put another post that don't go to the, and you can go to that post, but it's not going to have all of the things that we talked about here. I'm going to put a companion post down there and you can grab all of the links plus this talk was recorded so if you want more information as i said when i started out this talk osync curious is going to be the place to get it it's free it's easy you got these 10 minute long videos that teach most everything that i just taught you there's discrete videos that you can watch them on your lunch break or between bathing the kids whenever um, also, we have a, a podcast that's out there on all the major platforms where we talk about news, interview people. This past week's one was uh, interviewing a, a woman named Jane from BuzzFeed, who's a senior disinformation reporter. Amazing, amazing person and learned a lot about disinformation and misinformation. Also, I would be remiss if I did not mention that if you're interested in any of the things that I taught you here or introduced you to, come take my SEC 487 class. We've got these live online classes, which I don't know if you've been to any of them, but it's it's essentially where I or Nico Deacons, Deacons or John Turbush teach you just on this exact same type of platform where you have a Slack, you can interact with me, I can interact with you, you get virtual machine, 23 labs, six days of content, and sometimes we're in, these classes are taught um, over two weeks. So it's Monday through Friday from like whatever, uh, 8 p.m. till 1 a.m. Eastern time. That's for the Asia time frame. So if you are in Asia, that might be a great time for you. 
we we stagger the hours and we try to make it acceptable so that anybody can take the class. This class does have a certification. It's called the Go C certification. GIAC Open Source Intelligence. Go see, go find information you get. Okay, the jokes don't get any better, people. You should know that by now. Um, I've been Micah Hoffman, otherwise known as Web Breacher. There's my email if you have any questions. If you came in late, I will answer questions here too. I see a whole bunch of them here. Thank you for sending them in in the Q&A. Um, I will answer questions here, but if you are a person that doesn't want to answer a question here, pop me an email. Let me know that you saw this talk and I'm happy to answer it. If you didn't answer, if you didn't, uh, if uh, you don't mention the talk, then I, I still will answer the question. All right, let's see what we got here. As far as questions, oh, is that a Pokeball in your browser? Yeah, the Pro Pokeball is the, um, is the instant data scraper app. Um, all right, it looks like I'm missing some of these, hang on. Oh, okay. Uh, what was the course name? Sec 487. It's on the screen. Does it go to the dark web for search? Mm, I'm not sure exactly which tool you're talking about. Uh, Jason, if you want to clarify, you can. Can you give the GitHub reference? Absolutely. It's my hacker name here, Web Breacher. So github.com slash Web Breacher slash untapped scraper. And I can... I can throw that in the in the chat because I've got the chat right here. GitHub.com slash web breacher slash untapped ooh, hang on. Untapped scraper. There you go. It's in the chat. Um, and that gets you to my free Python tool, both the watcher and the scraper. Uh, I thought it was 8:30. Sorry, we started earlier, everybody. Um, yes, the invite I had showed 8:30. Yes, okay, I get that. Yes, uh, da, da, da. love your presentation. Oh, thank you. All right, is that a Pokeball? There you got that. I already told you, Instant Data Scraper would be all the tools used in this webcast even before the official schedule shared in the SANS website or on some other site. Uh, Marcello, um, Joshua, yes. Um, the tools that I shared here are going to be talked about and, and really discussed in depth on the OSINT Curious uh, website, which is a not, if you missed it, it's a nonprofit that I run here in the United States. I'm the president this year of it. And we share open source information with everybody and anybody. So osyncurio.us, the website is on the page right there. Um, let's see, that have some email address found on a have I been pwned is a good indication that the email account is legit. Yeah, so if there is an email account that has been found in, that you can find is in a dump from have I been pwned, then that email account has been used, but we don't know it actually is a good email address. It might be a made up one, like those ones on Dropbox. Those would show up in breaches, but Bruce Willis at hollywood.com, I doubt that's a real email. But there's other websites we can go to, like emailrep.io, that will tell us the reputation and tell us if it's a fake email as well. So we have other ways of figuring that out. Uh, CyberChef. CyberChef is an awesome tool, March Marcellino. Sorry. Um, yes. Really like your teaching style. Thanks, Nummies. Uh, pwned on five breach sites. Found no pastes. Uh, one of my emails has been pwned. Sorry to hear that, Cynthia. Any great tools or sources for skip tracing? Carl, skip tracing, the entire SANSEC 47 course is, uh, is focused on finding information about people, names, addresses, phone numbers, users, uh, computers they've used, Wi-Fi they've used. So take my class or head to osyncurious.com uh, or osyncurio.us. Full bunch of things there that will help skip tracers, private investigators. Most of the stuff is free too. So, I mean, all of the stuff on osyncurious is free but there's actually um, some of the, uh, most of the tools that we talk about, most all of them are free as well. And if you become a Patreon of OSINT Curious, I'll just throw this out there, pay as little as $1 a month, we're doing a special happy hour next week where um, we'll, come, we'll invite you and teach you for free for I think a half hour. No, it was like an hour. Um, cool, thank you, I'm glad that you thought it was entertaining. I was late to class. Uh, what do I have to do to learn to create some scripts you write on your GitHub? Well, Edgardo, um, 
I've been teaching myself Python for many years and just get in there and start trying things. There are lots of Python tutorials that you can use, but Python is, is a language you may not need to learn. If you're comfortable with things like JavaScript or other stuff, there's a lot of things to do in OSINT. What I just showed you across everything from untapped and uh, Snapchat, all the way to domains and breach data, that's stuff that I teach across six days in my class. And I mean, it's taken me lots of years to learn. I started out in, in psychology, went to medicine, didn't get into medical school. Then I started fixing computers. And I worked for many years as a system administrator and learning these skills. So that's where I, I'm coming from. Um, so let's see. Uh, Oh, well, Namish, uh, I appreciate that you want to see my webcast again. On my webreacher.com website, there's a whole bunch of YouTube videos with me. OSINT Curious has a whole bunch of podcasts with me and my colleagues um, talking about this stuff as well. Um, let's see. So let's see. Thanks, Micah. Yep. Um, first time a webcast. Let's see. Will you do a webcast like this again? Yes, I will. Um, for CPEs, Luan. I think you go to your SANS portal and you'll get credit for that in there. Thanks, Mike, for the uh, props. What is digital, the data visualization site? Um, Susie, uh, actually, Igor, that is, um, that is OSINTCombine.com. And again, on WebReacher.com, my website, I'll write up a little blog post in just a little bit or maybe first thing tomorrow morning and post that so that you have all of the different sites I went to today. Top three favorite tools I do I use while on an engagement. I actually just tweeted that out. Go to my Twitter, Web Breacher, and you'll find out. Does the data viz tool at OSINT Combine store the data? No. All of the tools that OSINT Combine does are Java-based tools. So it's just in your web browser. It'll cause your Firefox or Chrome to start consuming huge amounts of RAM, but it doesn't go to his site at all. There are also other clients, if uh, Melanie, if you want to do something more local and you have a huge data set, I wouldn't use OSINT Combine. Um, Multigo has case file, and on the OSINT Curious website, the very first blog post talks about how to use, um, uh, essentially how to do that data scraping, then putting it into Multigo's case file tool to visualize that same thing that I showed you here, okay? So um, you can do that. Uh, the tool that went to 194 sites is what's my name dot app, Jason. And let's see, do you have any concerns about providing my email address to have I been pwned? Nope. CA, because if my email address, I just treat my email address as public data. There are so many places on the internet that have all of my email addresses. It's been in so many breaches. Giving that away to a site that is trusted, made by Troy Hunt in Australia, I gotta trust somebody. And the value I get from giving them my email address and my mother-in-law's email address and my kids' email addresses is that I get a heads up when somebody's gonna be doing something bad with my information. Uh, will anyone be able to OSINT on me? Absolutely, Namish. I live in the United States. So um, we are the land of sharing way too much information. Even if I try to remove all my information from all the different sites, there are more sites that are going to pop up that have demographic information and other things about me. There are things you can do, but that's going to be a different web, uh, different talk, how to protect yourself. Um, there are things you can do to decrease it. Esther, SEC 40, 587, uh, when is it going to become an official course? I think it's 587 is going to probably be next year, but uh, there's going to be a new course that's an OSINT course probably later in the summer that's going to come out. It's going to have a full day of Python. So take you from zero to doing some advanced things in Python in one day. It's going to be tough, but also a whole bunch of other things. And uh, Nico Dakins, John Turbush, and I are writing that now. So stay tuned, Esther. Uh, watch, my, watch my webcast. Uh, watch my uh, social media. What tool did you use to create my presentation with? Uh, um, uh, on the video and PowerPoint below. Um, so, the, oh, the video and the PowerPoint below, this is go to uh, webinar. That's what this tool is. Great podcast, thank you. One last question, Andrea, you snuck in at the last minute. Andrea, any good OSINT CTF sites? Yes, I have two sites that I recommend for CTFs. One is Trace Labs, 
tracelabs.org. Tracelabs.org is a nonprofit in Canada. They work with law enforcement around the world to find missing persons cases that are cold, not being worked on. They take that information that's public, they put it into their system, and then you get the opportunity to go and do open source intelligence on those people. Find new bits of data on these cases that are not being worked, submit it to Trace Labs, they take that data, give it to law enforcement, and who knows, you could change somebody's life. Other than that, there are other places. I would say hooking up on Trace Labs, um, tracelabs.slack.com, their Slack. There's a huge number of people that are there that are willing to talk to you about getting a job, sharing resources, and so much more. We are at an hour and a half now, and I need to let Jeff, Jessica go. So thank you so much for being here. As I mentioned, my email address is right there. Hit me up on Twitter. Hit me up on LinkedIn. Tell me that you saw the talk. Uh, send me an email. Thank you for coming, everybody. It's been great.